Coming up, a new study looks at college affordability for Native students. We're learning about the happenings at the Toronto International Film Festival, and a new documentary tackles the high rate of suicide on the Flathead Reservation. I am Malia Chavez. Join us for those interviews plus headlines from the ICT Newscast. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people. The Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication at Arizona State University is a proud supporter of Indian Country Today. Students at Cronkite News and Gaylord College at the University of Oklahoma cover indigenous communities together. This important work is distributed by more than 100 news organizations. This collaboration provides a much-needed boost to coverage of Native American communities nationwide. Learn more at cronkitenews.azpbs.org. This is the ICT Newscast with Aliyah Chavez. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to the next chapter of the ICT Newscast. As you can see, we have a new look. Recording the A Block in 5, 4, 3, 2. The ICT Newscast started at the height of the COVID-19 pandemic. It began as a roundtable of Indigenous journalists. Then it became a broadcast from Patti Tholohongva's living room. A few months later, we engineered a set and moved to the visitor center at the Phoenix Indian School. In March 2021, we set up shop in Studio A using a donated set at Arizona PBS. Now we're starting a new chapter, which is just down the hall in Studio B. You might be asking, what exactly does a new studio mean? It means a new, fresh space. And it also means we can welcome in-studio guests because we have more camera angles. We'll also get to hire more people on the ICT production team to fill our growing control room. It also gets us ready for a surprise project, but I'll let you in on the secret. We're doing live election coverage in November. The goal of our news organization from the beginning, when our founder Tim Gallego started, was to tell indigenous stories. With this new studio, we're more excited than ever to keep that legacy going. Well, hundreds of places and locations around the United States have new names. Last week, the Interior Department announced it had completed the renaming process of nearly 650 geographic features that were previously named after the S-word. These are names for features like valleys, streams, summits, and peaks. Some of the replacement names include Needle Spring and Bull Spring Mountain in California. In Idaho, a summit was renamed to Mist Peak. This process was started in November of last year by Interior Secretary Deb Holland. At the time, she said the push to rename these places was a way to reckon with the ra racist pastime of the nation. For years, many of people have said the five-letter S-word was sexist towards Indigenous women. With the agency's final vote by the Board on Geographic Names, this is the last step in the process. In Canada, nearly 70% of households in the very rural area of Nunavut are food insecure. APTN's Kent Driscoll has the story. Nunavut's rate of hunger continues to rise. A Kaluit Food Center reports that when federal pandemic financial benefits were available, they were serving less than 100 meals a day to hungry Akaluit Miut. Now, the number is up to over 450 daily in a town of just under 8,000 people. The loss of the benefit and inflation means more people than ever in Nunavut are going hungry. That's why these Baffin Island residents are meeting in Akaluit for Niri Katagit, a food security roundtable. One of the biggest reasons for Nunavut's high cost of food is that Nunavut imports almost all its food via airplane. Food grown or raised closer to home means savings for Nunavut. That's why Sonny Gray from North Star Agriculture traveled here from Yukon. He's an experienced Arctic farmer and had ideas to share. Here's what he heard when he brought up the idea of using low-tech community freezers. And some of those elders, they, they piped up pretty quick and said, yeah, you know what, when I was little, 
that's how we did it. And so the introduction of technology has its merit and, it's, and it has its, you know, it, it has its negative side as well. And so we see that a lot, I think, in the north. Every community in Nunavut has one of these, a dump. These aren't landfills. These are dumps with little or no sorting or recycling. Properly composted, that's nutrient-rich soil that could be growing food. And, and composting is a, is a combination of food waste and animal waste and, and, you know, carbon, so cardboard, chipped cardboard, or there's, there's lots of that that's, it's waste, and it's going to waste when we think it could probably be used to build some soil. There are a few greenhouses in Nunavut. This is a Iqaluit. The one in a Iqaluit donates much of their food to the local food center. That potential soil being lost to the dump could be used to grow food. Growing food can be done in northern temperatures, according to a person who does it. And a lot of the cold climate that they experience here is, is the same as what we get in the Yukon. You know, that minus 30, minus 40. We even have minus 50. I was farming for two weeks and minus 50. Um, so that's, that part's transferable. The lack of soil makes it challenging, but it's not insurmountable. Nunavut's food situation is already desperate. Even more so when you remember that Nunavut has Canada's youngest and fastest growing population. Whatever these delegates figure out how to grow, one thing is certain. People will eat it. Kent Driscoll, ABTN National News, Halloween. And those are the headlines for the ICT Newscast. A new study released in August found that the main obstacle for Native students to complete college is affordability. Joining us today to break down the findings of that study is the CEO of the Native Forward Scholars Fund, Angelique Albert. Hi, Angelique. Thank you so much for being here. Pesquex. Good day, Elia. It's good to see you again. Same here. I mean, let's just jump right in here. This study looks at student attrition. What exactly does that mean? Student attrition is really looking at the number of students that that kind of fall out along the way. With this study, some of the research has shown that 36% of our Native students are completing compared to 60% of, of the rest of the students in the country. So it really speaks to this, this study dives into some of the reasons why we are losing them. You really get a sense of the college native college student experience. And it kind of, you can dig into that. Maybe tell us more about what this study found. Like you said, the primary obstacle to completion is affordability. So the study kind of digs into debt accrual, financial aid, some of your, um, how your personal finances are and, and really breaks that down. And so I encourage anyone to, to look into that, um, into the study. Who exactly did you survey and what were they asked? Well, I'll say this, it's an unprecedented study for two reasons. Um, first of all, it is a native led research project by the four national native scholarship providers. Like you said, it's College Fund, ACES, IEI, and Native Forward. And collectively, we've pulled our resources and expertise to really shine a light on our students um, to create visibility for them. Secondly, we've surveyed, to answer your question, um, over 12,000 students. They are previous scholars, current scholars, and we feel that this is the largest data set uh, that is out there and it is unprecedented secondly because it creates a baseline so often us as native people we are the other when it comes to research we are the asterisks and this creates a baseline data so that our students are no longer invisible so that they are um, a discussion point when it comes to student success and helping them to persist and graduate when you talk about student success, when I read the study, one of the things that stood out to me was that a number of Native students are actually facing homelessness while they're in college. Maybe tell us more about that. Absolutely. Our students are experiencing food insecurity, um, experiencing homelessness. 16% of our students are experiencing homelessness. I personally know students who have had to choose between going to college and having a place to live. And they chose to live in their car so that they could um, go to college. So this is something that 
um, 16 percent of our students are experiencing and we i just really hope people read this study and also look at the recommendations for path forward because it gives a a, a real a pathway and recommendations no matter where you are in academia if you're serving native students this gives a way to really enact change for our students. Angelique, maybe talk about why a study like this is important to begin with. I think in Native communities we hear so often and stories that we hear from our relatives that being in college is really difficult um, and that it costs a lot. And we've heard anecdotally a lot of things about things like food insecurity, but maybe talk about why data like this, why um, tangible data is important on this topic. It's important because the students that we surveyed are going through the same struggles that I went through when I was in my undergraduate um, studies. And, and it helps us to have a baseline to create change. Um, I'll give you a tangible, something real that, that, that we can do as scholarship providers. And this just gives you an example. When you look at debt accrual, 60% of our students are acquiring debt of $10,000 or less. So if I, as a scholarship provider, can, can give a scholarship of $10,000, then we can get rid of that, uh, that student debt. You talked about recommendations, and we only have a short time left here, um, but what are some of those recommendations from this study? The recommendations are really for anyone from K-12 to um, college level institutions and beyond. So the, um, it speaks to K-12, really looking at financial literacy. And um, if you're looking at a college level, it's really looking at debt reduction, ensuring that we have cultural supports on campuses. And truly just, there's a, there's a ton of, of information. So I encourage anyone to go to our websites for the four of us uh, scholarship providers. The, the research is there. I encourage you to read it and um, enact some change for our Native students. Angelique Albert, thank you so much. Lamb lunch, thank you. ICT brings you news from Canada, and we do that with our special correspondent, Miles Moore. So earlier this summer, he brought us firsthand accounts of the Pope's visit, and we've asked him to join us again to tell us about the Toronto International Film Festival. Hi, Miles. Thank you so much for being here. Hello, Leigh. How are you? Good to be here. I'm doing well, thank you. I mean, let's just dive right in here. Uh, you recently went to the International Toronto International Film Festival. Tell us what you observed and who you saw speak there. Well, it was the 47th annual Toronto International Film Festival, or TIFF as it's known, and um, it had a large Indigenous uh, representation of films. There were over a dozen films, uh, about eight from Canada, four international, and the festival opened up with the uh, premiere, the world premiere of the uh, Buffy St. Marie documentary, Carry It On. Uh, Buffy St. Marie was was at the festival to uh, to take questions after the uh, the showing of the, of the film uh, just remains just this absolutely dynamic passionate artist political social activist i mean even the question answer after she's she's putting ideas out there to continue to encourage people to you know be involved in in making um, you know strengthening indigenous arts indigenous rights are speaking up for our people this is this is her life and it just so much passion, a very impressive person, individual in the movie reflects, captures that. So that was a great thing to see. Let's actually take a deeper look at that. We actually have a clip that you shot from the Toronto International Film Festival. Let's take a look. Um, the, the Pope, who I like very much, I really uh, admire uh, Pope Francis. Um, and I would love to see him since he He's, you know, a lot of Indigenous people are yelling at the Catholic Church, do away with the doctrine of discovery. 
in in their in their perspective, they have already gotten rid of the doctrine of discovery. They abandoned that a long time ago. However, the countries that were colonized with uh, un, under under the uh, uh, under the words of the doctrine of discovery, which says to to force to force their persons into perpetual slavery, you know, to kill them and to take all of their land. See, the countries that were colonized under that rule, are it's still in their books. So don't tell me that that was a long time ago. The 15th century was a long time ago. Ruth Bader Ginsburg used the doctrine of discovery to defeat the Oneidas. And that wasn't very long ago. And she regretted it for the rest of her life, but she did it. She wrote the majority opinion, believe it or not. That's how ignorant even the smartest people are about indigenous things. I mean, Miles, wow, what a statement from Buffy St. Marie. Um, tell us, what were people in the audience saying about what she had to say? Well, it was, it was just part of, of who she is. You know, somebody said, what would you like to see? And this is just the first thing that, that, that came up. And then, and then uh, somebody else, you know, other things with her cradle board teaching project, the educational tools that she's helped develop that are indigenous specific and about taking control of, of education. She, she talked a lot about that. So there are a lot of cheers and just people being, being inspired. It was, yeah, it was a great way to pick up, uh, take off the festival. I do have to mention just a number of other films that are being represented there. Uh, Darling Napont has a has a new film called Stellar, which is just supposed to be this magical kind of trippy cosmic indigenous love story and, and something I'd, I'd I'd like to see. I saw a film called Rosie uh, that was directed by Gail Maurice. Just wonderful, a real feel good film. It takes on tough subjects about uh, kids in foster care, transphobia, uh, urban housing issues. Like it's and it's and it's it, it's a feel good film about a you know a, a mixed up family that finds love and family one of those you know just a great feel-good film and as well uh um uh, another film by uh, marie clement called bones of crows a two-hour epic going over a hundred years like these are filmmakers at the at the peak of their craft and have to say led by indigenous women indigenous creators really stepping out at the tiff festival this year Miles, we only have about 30 seconds here uh, left, and I hate to leave you on such a big question, but of course, Queen Elizabeth II died last week. Um, very quickly, tell us what this means for, for First Nations communities in Canada. Uh, there is that unique relationship. It is, you know, it's a crown, often referred to a crown Indigenous, a crown First Nations relationship. So the role of the, of the, of the monarchy, the role of the Queen has been very important. Should be noted the Queen's last official statement was condolences to the James Smith Cree Nation that suffered that uh, tragedy the week before the Labor Day weekend. That was her last statement, died the next day. And the Okama, the chief of James Smith Cree, offered his condolences. So a lot of condolences, certainly the issues all around, as they say, very complicated history, the difficult um, history of the monarchy and its role in colonization, all of those things are certainly part of the discussion here in Canada. But that relationship that the Queen had over 70 years as this symbolic leader certainly um, there's a lot of a lot of heavy emotions um, on both sides here in Canada. I can imagine well miles more so thank you so much. Thank you very much Leah. The documentary for Walter and Josiah puts the spotlight on the Flathead Indian Reservation in Montana because of a very alarming statistic. Monta Montana has a high rate of suicide. Uh, with September being National Suicide Prevention Awareness Month, ICT's senior correspondent Patty Thalahongba spoke to the producer of the documentary. Aaliyah, two of the people who died in that one year played on the high school basketball team. The documentary follows the team as they continue to play to honor the boys who died, but to also uplift their community. 
Well, Dana, many non-natives might not know about the high rates of suicide in Indian country, but those high rates have been around for a long time. Uh, tell us why you got involved personally with the making of this documentary. Well, in um, 2011, I lost my own daughter to suicide. Um, and that, you know, that was a devastating time, life-changing, crushing time for me. And I got really busy in the community to um, just do what I can to not have this happen to anybody ever again. And that's kind of how I've lived my life since then. And um, I started a new job as a suicide prevention worker. And like my first week, they said, hey, this documentary is coming. Do you want to go check them out and see what they want to do? And that's how it really, truly started. They really spent a lot of time with me making sure that we we were telling our story, that they weren't coming in from the outside trying to fix us or um, see things or say things or make it appear like we're saying things that we weren't saying. Um, so I was really utilized um, for my knowledge of the community and my exp my own life experiences and the experiences of the families involved, I think is the biggest thing. And I'm willing to share. Um, it's a taboo subject. So suicide is, you don't talk about it. You don't, um, you just don't, it's a stigma. There's, it's a stigmatizing issue, and I don't think that that's helpful. Well, your documentary talks about the impacts of historical trauma. How does that relate to the high number of suicides? The historical trauma has everything to do with what's happening with many of the dysfunctions in the community. Um, when you take away who we were for thousands of years and replace it with other other cultures, um, expectations, or um, colonization, and all this stuff that happened um, really changed who we were as people. Um, we don't no longer do many of the things that we had done forever. So trying to figure out and, and navigate your way through that, there's so many traumas over time, you can't even pick one that would have caused this. There's multiple over generations that keep happening. Um, and we're still suffering from that. So, you know, it doesn't, it shouldn't surprise anybody that we're in this, in this horrible um, epidemic. There was one man in your documentary who mentioned a change in how people value life. What did he mean by that? Before, in probably my grandparents' time or before that, there was a, a, a an honoring and a understanding of how the world's, um, how we how, how we communicate and our relationship with everything around us was a certain way. Well, with the traumas and everything that's happened and how things have changed, that's broken. So um, the shifts, the, the social norms and shifts are way different than they were before. I guess that's what I, how, how I interpret he's um, done. And I have seen just in the last, 20 years, a major shift in how social media and um, just the social norms um, that we live in are way different than they were. And I think that puts people at risk and trying to figure out who they are and where they fit and um, the what cultural um, activities they should be doing or not doing. Those things are, are not being taught, they're not being learned, or they're not being respected. Um, so those are some of the things I think that can cause this. So given that, how important is um, the Salish Kootenai culture uh, in, in preventing suicide? I think that reconnecting to our culture, whether it's Salish or Kootenai or Pondere, whatever tribe it is, um, whatever your ethnic background is, is, is really crucial in um making sure you have more resiliency factors and more connections to your family, your community, um, the land you live on and strengthening those relationships will impact um, your own personal wellness. I think um, knowing who you are, where you come from is really important. So that cultural connection is, is key in many cases, you think? I believe so. I believe it is. And if, if you weren't taught it, I, it's not too late to learn it. Um, or if you have lived it at one time in your life and you've left it, it's, it's okay to go back and relearn it and, and start practicing those practices again. In some ways, I think that that's key too, is that there used to be such a divide between 
uh, people who lived on reservations and people who lived in cities. And those lines are really starting to blur now. It's not as uh, a stigma to live in the city. So your message of it's okay to come back uh, perhaps resonates. It does. I actually was raised in the city. So I understand that urban Indian versus reservation Indian uh, um, lifestyle or differences. Um, and they're, they're very similar because I wasn't around all my culture growing up and I came back and I learned it, but now we have people who live here who are disconnected as well. So we do have to work really hard to, to reconnect people to who they are, who their ancestors were, um, and what our, um, norms should be in order to, um, be healthier and more connected to each other and our community, our families, those kinds of things. I believe, and then it would make us much more stronger and able to um, just live healthier. But I have, I have hope. I, ha I have to have hope, otherwise I couldn't continue to do what I do. Dana Hewankorn, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. And that's a slice of our Indigenous world. For all the latest, visit ictnews.org. Stay safe, my relatives. Sometimes you got to take a step. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting a private corporation funded by the American people.